One of the things I've always loved about this show is that every single person, every character has an incredible show-stopping number. It's not like you gave yourself all of the good songs and gave everyone else B songs. Um, so I'm sort of curious, as you watch this show, what is a song or a number that someone else has that you love so much that you would have, have honestly loved to have performed on stage in front of a crowd? Pretty much every song I'm not in. Um, you know, I remember standing in the wings uh, during the raucous applause for Room Where It Happens and just being like, Oh, I really had to give that one to Burr. <laughs> My favorite songs are the ones I should definitely not be doing. <laughs> like, <laughs> like one last time and wait for it. I have no business singing those songs and should never ever touch them. I, you know, if I could just do, if I could just do uh, the Angelica rap section of Satisfied, that that would give me a lot of joy. Renee, a lot of people have said Satisfied. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I'm glad. Uh, I'm honored that they picked it. Um, they're all in it. That's the beauty of it. So they they they, they just probably just don't want to have to roll throw their bodies around me. <laughs> I will tell you the, the 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 one that moves me the most, and particularly in the way Tommy's filmed it for this movie, is is satisfied. You know, Angelica is really the smartest character in the show. Um, she presents her emotions as if it was like a perfectly worded uh, essay. And uh, I, I just, I, I'm in awe of the way Renee delivers it. I could never deliver it as well, but um, I'm, I'm really proud of my writing on that one and, and the way she, she, she meets it. The thing about Satisfied is that like Renee has all of that incredible language, which is like, I'm sure so difficult, but very like exciting for people mm -hmm. who love words. Um, but the world is like swirling around her and she just sort of like gets to move through yeah. it. <laughs> which is very enticing. Mm -hmm. that, those are actually the best bars in the show. That's actually the hardest rap in the show. And Lafayette gets a lot of credit for that, but hers are way more complicated. And so yeah. I, I would do that, but not the rest of that song. I shouldn't sing that either. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy staying in my lane. I remember when, when um, Lynn changed the end of Guns and Ships so Dabi can rap like Again. even faster. And after that, I was like, dang, I wish I could rap like this. <laughs> so oh, I'm, he's so I'm good not, in that. It's always like a song where like, I wish I was like such a good fast rapper that I could just rap like W Diggs. Hurricane. Ooh. Ooh. Easy. Hurricane. That's Hurricane. One. Okay. Now, because I also think like we, you know, by the time, because the state, the, the show was almost staged chrono, you know, in chronological order, you know, Lynn was writing it as we were making it, you know, uh, Renee remembers. Um, and, um, and so it's, it was staged in that way. And so there was something about the staging of Hurricane too, like we were so, we were a well-oiled machine. So like the performances, the staging, the, the lighting, the costumes, the, choreography, everything comes together in a really wonderful That's way. That's awesome. Actually, Wait For It, I love, but I don't want to perform it. The, the two things I would want to perform, The World Was Wide Enough, I love. And Burn, in terms of yes. performing it, they, they, I think they, 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 it's such a core, like everything in Burn, she's saying exactly how she feels and world is wide enough. It's just that revelation of like, what the fuck did I just do that, that many people have had? And yeah. uh, just being able to sit in that really and how it's written, those are the two that I would, I would love to perform. I actually love that, 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 that band of brothers sitting on the table in the beginning of the show, getting to know each other and getting to meet each other. And um, I just, oh, it just looked like the chemistry and the joy they had. I mean, it never was not there, no matter how tired anybody was. They're all such, so individual characters and they just fall in love with each other instantly. And um, I always thought it would be really fun to be a part of that moment. Well, all of them, really. And I don't mean to be, you know, cagey about it. I, I so enjoy watching every single person perform uh, and, and the, the moments that are created, uh, especially because I was a part of a lot of them, but I never could really, from, this, from my perspective, ever really, you know, see what was happening on that stage. And so for me, like anything that I, that I got to watch, I enjoy it. I don't want to perform anybody else's songs, but my own because I would not do them as well as the person that is, is in the role doing them currently.
Um, you know, I've always heard that expression in theater that you you play to the back of the room. And I always just assumed that that meant, you know, just because people are so far away that it's harder to, to be a little bit more subtle because if they're yards away from you, they can't really pick up on it. But I'm curious now that the camera is sort of in your face, it's, it's almost like I'm on stage with you. What is an aspect of your performance of the character that maybe I wouldn't have picked up on if I was sitting out in the crowd? But now that I'm that close to you, I'm finally going to be able to see it. I don't think it's an accident that like so many of our original cast have gone on to incredible success in film and TV. When you see this movie, they're just never less than absolutely real and in the moment, whether you're here or whether you're 50 feet away. And, and that's, I think that's you know, a mark of their incredible work. And I feel so lucky to have been in their company. I spent like the first, you know, I got all this great theater training at Carnegie Mellon. You know, Renee and I went to the same conservatory in Pittsburgh, got this really fabulous theater, theatrical training, and then I went and did TV for a decade. Uh, Eliza had a lot of uh, very internal moments, especially during Burn. Mm -hmm. And um, for a show that has like very extravagant choreography and um, like we were talking about earlier, uh, Oak has this fabulous moment where he like busts out before his Hercules Mulligan rap. And um, I think for that song in particular, like it's just me on a bench with some letters. And uh, if you're in the back of the house, like, you know, hopefully the storytelling was powerful enough that like you understood what was happening. But uh, I think to be able to come in a little closer in that moment, uh, and Tommy has captured it so beautifully and I'm so grateful to him for how kind he has been to me in that moment. Uh, but I'm excited for people to get to see that. Usually I really do have to remind myself, you know, about the, about the larger storytelling, about making sure that the story can be read in the back of the house. And so 500 performances in, literally, you know, they bring the cameras back in now for Hamilton. And I got to, I was really excited to add, to add some things that I really wasn't doing because I knew it would not read in a theater to add some of the small gestural work and the um, just the, 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 the smaller nuanced kind of storytelling that you can do that, that, um, gets lost in the theater. I only know how to act one way, kind of. And so like, and it, and it for me, it's like about never turning it off just because the moment's not mine, you know, or the yeah. lights are off or whatever. Cause if I get out of it, I'm, I've lost it. So it's totally self-serving, but like, I'm always, I was always doing things on that stage. And what makes me happy about this, about, and I, and I think that's true of everybody. And I think what's, what makes me happy about capturing it like this is you're capturing one essentially, really two and a half, but really like one instance of this. And everybody, my experience with everyone on stage was that it was a totally different show every night. And so you might catch some stuff that this was a once in a lifetime, you might never have seen that again. And yeah. when you're watching the whole show, it's such a big experience. You are choosing what to look at, you know? And so in this instant, Tommy got to go through and be like, that's pretty cool. I'm gonna make sure everybody sees this right now. But that might be the only time that ever happened. Uh, I'd say more so for James Madison, like like with Pips's Eliza, he, there's a lot of subtlety with him that I think people won't necessarily get. And I think you'll, I mean, didn't, didn't necessarily get in the stage production, but on camera, I think you kind of see a lot of who the character of James Madison is. He's constantly processing information. He's constantly giving his point of view and he's very withheld and reserved. And I think the camera um, really allows you to kind of get a peek into him outside of being the dude next to Jefferson. I'm all, you also have to realize that. <laughs> I, I'm watching the movie for the, you know, that's the first time I'd ever seen the show, really. So maybe I did it all the time, but I think it was new stuff. Like there was, um, <laughs> there was a scene with uh, when Hamilton comes over to the house, um, when he comes over to the house in nonstop at the end of Act One, <laughs> and um, and Tommy and I spent all this time talking about. It's such a small moment, but to bring specificity to it, we talked about what Hamilton was pulling Burr away from in the house. You know, um, is it in the middle of dinner? Are they putting Theodosia to bed? You know, so it's just the, you know, the um, the duality of that of of keeping that story alive, keeping what's happening inside the house alive while I'm dealing with Hamilton. And I think I, I think some of that gestural stuff I don't think I was doing if the cameras were not there. Eliza, Eliza is singing at the very in the very end and she's singing who lives and dies and, and she says you know I raised funds for the Washington Monument I, I I speak out against slavery and and Washington is walking into that saying that he tells she tells my story um 
there's a moment there that that Tommy and I came to together as as a means to bring the the life and the failure of Washington's greatest failure to Chris, uh, where I actually get to participate in the final telling of the story in that moment. Um, don't need to say what it is. But it's a very short and very small thing, but when you see it, um, that's a really special little uh, uh, nugget. Uh, uh, just a, just theater, you know, just theater <laughs> happening, and a, and a director and an actor coming to um, coming to a, a, a just a, a moment of expression that that bends beyond just the realm of the show. You know, so much of this show is about legacy and, and who's going to tell your story when you're gone. I'm curious if you could imagine sitting in a theater and watching Hamilton with the person, the real person that you're playing, what is the moment in the show you would be most curious to kind of like look over to see how they're reacting to it? If he doesn't walk out during the opening number, I think we're okay because we're, we're doing a highlight reel of the worst traumas of his life in two verses, in two choruses. Um, so if he survives that, I'll, I'll be keen to watch the, the rest of the, the reaction because, um, you know, it's, uh, this is, um, when I think about legacy, I, I think about the show itself. You know, the show hasn't changed in five years, but it resonates in different ways depending on how the world changes around it. And that's been in awe-inspiring to see. I think the moment they saw a black person on stage being them, I think that'd be, from jump, just to be like, hey man, how you feel? It's a slave up there playing your thoughts. I think that for me would be the the moment uh, to see, yeah. I think the moment for me would be um, the very end of the show after uh, Hamilton has just been shot and um, the end of the, the show, the song at the end of the show starts and it's who lives, who dies, who tells your story. Um, and Eliza comes out. I think this was a woman who really in no way shape or form ever wanted to be glorified or put on a pedestal in that way and she spent the whole remainder of her life trying to advocate and glorify other people including her husband um so the fact that you know she comes out at the end uh, the, uh, the the story is ending and the last thing that you see is her um so powerful and um i hope that it's like it's like the one small thing like every night i would sort of like the show would be coming to an end and I'd look out and I would just be thinking like, you know, I hope she's proud and enjoying this. Guys, it's a truly one of the greatest honors of my life. Mr. Moran, I don't know if you remember our first chat in Chicago. I have it I framed remember. here. And it I was so nervous and it was one of the genuinely one of the greatest interviews of my entire life. And I've never gotten to show you this, but I actually really? won I actually won one of these because of our incredible conversation. So genuinely, this is from the bottom of my heart, one of the greatest honors of my life. And I oh, genuinely appreciate you guys. It's so guys. great, Jake. Good to see you guys. Jake Hamilton, no relation. Good day, Chicago. Guys, seriously, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for this. is genuinely one of the greatest honors of my life, getting to talk to all of you. So seriously, thank you oh, so much. Thank, thank you, so you for um, having us here. Thanks for I want to start up. I love your oh, yeah, if, yeah, if you can't tell, my place is decorated. And people walk in and they go like, seriously, your, your last name all over your apartment. But it's, <laughs> it's good about that. Oh, I want to start by saying I will never forget the, the first time I saw the show. It was one of the most incredible experiences of my entire life. I'm curious. You, obviously, you guys are very close to it. You worked on it for a long time. Can you tell me about the first time you got to sit back, sit in a crowd, and actually enjoy the show without working it? The first time I got to experience the show was not actually in front of a crowd. It was during a rehearsal process uh, early in, in, in previews because uh, I had been conducting every performance up until that point. So I had not gotten a chance to sit back and take it in. And the first time I saw the song, The Story of Tonight, sung by these four gentlemen in the pub celebrating wh where they were and, and what they had achieved, I started to cry because all of a sudden I realized, my gosh, these were just young men just like us who had a dream about something and were willing to put their lives in the line. And we're talking about changing the future, talking about, you know what, I might not be able to see the effects of the, 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 the seeds I'm planting right now, but I'm playing the long game. And all of a sudden I realized, my God, how lucky am I to be living here in this country, doing what I love to do because of some people who had an idea and were able to speak up and be brave enough and put their lives in the line for something. That, that really affected me. And, and interestingly, my, my story is the backstage story also, that by the time we started to have audiences coming in, that momentum was coming at us in terms of pressure to continue the hard work. 
So it wasn't, you could feel the wave of the audience, but the day, the day that it struck me so deeply was when we presented the first act of the, the workshop of the show. So it was the first time we staged the show, we staged the first act and did a reading of the second act. And at the end of that first act, I was pinching myself, my wife was with me, and I was like, I've never been in something like this, involved in something like this, and I've never been given the opportunity to be a part of something that could have so much power behind it. And it was a really staggering moment of, of uh, thanks and blessing to know that I would been, had been gifted friendship with people like Alex and Lynn and Tommy to be a part of a team with a tremendous cast who could say something so important. Unbelievable. Um, you know, uh, Andy, I've, I've, well, both of you guys, I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of, uh, I've been very fortunate and then I've been able to see the show multiple times. The very first time I saw it, I was on the orchestra level. I was very lucky to be able to sort of be almost right there and kind of just let it wash over me. But it wasn't until the, the second time that I saw it and I was in the upper level and I saw Different. the stage for the first time and really saw how it's moving and it's really a character in and of itself. I'm curious, Andy, how difficult yep. that was or what that was like sort of using the stage for your cho choreography, because that's a whole other element you have to take yeah. into account. Well, you can't see it, but on the other side of the room, I actually have a, a, the model of the floor. And no. so I would, I would choreograph during the day, and then I would go home at night, and the, the, the set, the model rotated. So I would put on Alex's tracks. I would time the movement, and, and, and I would watch the staging happen in rotation. And so I could really imagine it. I had no idea how far Hal Binkley was gonna take it yeah. with the lights, because the lighting really completed that picture. But it was a really great opportunity to choreograph a set as well as choreograph with people. So it was, re it was really amazing. In London, there's a seat that almost looks straight down on the stage. And it's oh. an amazing vantage point. It feels, it feels like you're watching a pinball machine. <laughs> what? I have to piggyback on this because you have to, uh Big, uh, massive shout out to Andy Blanky Wheeler, who was able to, in his mind, plan out and map out how the set was going to move and how the rotations were going to be just so to be able to tell a dancer, okay, when you dance your step, you're going to start here, but end over there. Oh, my God. We rehearsed the show. We didn't have a turntable in the room. So we were all just confused. Like, what? We, I'm going to be over there, but do this here. But once we got to the stage and actually tried it out of the turntable, every calculation that Andy had made was exactly perfect because he was able to see it in his head ahead of time it was miraculous i i, I, but, but I have to tell you it was, sorry that i was doing that model in my mother-in-law's kitchen and and she doesn't she didn't speak english and so i like had a glass of wine and i'm turning the model for hours on end and she turned to my wife and she's like is he going crazy <laughs> the answer was I, Yes. yes, yes, absolutely. Guys, from the bottom, if you can't tell, the show obviously means a great deal to me. This has been, today is one of the greatest honors of my life, getting to interview people who are geniuses. So from the bottom of my heart, I can't thank you enough for your time, for your time uh, and generally, you so truly an honor. Thank you yeah, so much. Who's the picture with you and the one behind you? That's, that's Lynn. I love it. So yeah, so, so, I, so we took a picture. He was kind enough. I interviewed him when the show came to Chicago. Oh, and uh, yeah, and he, he was kind enough to sign my, my vinyl for me. And, and uh, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's forever in my, enshrined. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, for Thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful nice day. Thank you.